In the last video, we took a look at the finite differences method and applied it to a one-dimensional engineering problem. In this video, we take this idea a little further and apply it to problems in more than one dimension. Perhaps the best idea is to look at a two-dimensional problem and see what new ingredients are required to solve it. This is Laplace's equation. It comes up very often in engineering and physics problems, but we will save that for later. The important thing now is that it is a differential equation whose solution is a function depending on two variables, x and y. In fact, it is a so-called partial differential equation since the derivatives are partial derivatives. Perhaps it is a good idea to take a look at the definition of partial derivative. It is very similar to the definition of the standard derivative, we just fix one of the coordinates. If the definitions are so closely related, perhaps we can use the same methods we used in the last video to find the formulas for the finite difference method applied to partial derivatives. You probably remember that we used the Taylor expansion to find our formulas for the one-dimensional problems. We can do it again, but now using the Taylor expansion for a function of two variables. Before looking at the formulas for the finite differences in two dimensions, let's set up our notation properly. In one dimension, we divided the domain into a grid of n points, delta x apart from each other. Now we assume that the domain is divided into an n by m grid with points separated by delta x horizontally and delta y vertically. Here we will use the same notation as before, replacing the arguments of the function by the subscripts corresponding to the nodes on the grid. Using the same type of arguments, we find the following finite differences where the forward and backward differences are first order accurate and the central differences are second order accurate. With these formulas at hand, we can now tackle some engineering problems. We first take a look at heat conduction without heat sources solved on a square plate. It is precisely Laplace's equation, it just means physically that, at a given point, the amount of heat coming in and coming out must be the same. It is a second-order differential equation in two dimensions, so we must specify four boundary conditions. In this example, we consider prescribed temperatures at every edge. We could just as well prescribe heat fluxes across the boundaries of the plate or a combination of the two. To apply the finite differences method, we break the domain using a regular grid as we've talked about just a moment ago. We use n plus 1 points in each direction to do this. We can now easily apply the central difference formulas for the second order partial derivatives with respect to x and y and find n plus 1 squared algebraic equations on the values of the temperature at each grid point. We can easily organize this system of equations into its matrix form and feed it to a computer, which can easily and efficiently solve such a system of equations even for quite large n. Finally, we obtain the solution we were searching for. Now, let's consider the transient heat equation solved on a bar of length 1. We know the initial distribution of temperature across the bar and also the temperature of the boundaries at all times. These are the so-called initial condition and boundary conditions of the problem. Sure, it is slightly different from the problem we have solved before, but what about it? We can just apply the most accurate formulas we have available and move on, right? Well, not so fast. If we try to apply the central formula for the spatial derivative, it's all good, since we have specified boundary conditions at both ends of the bar. But Take a look at the formula for the central finite difference when applied to the derivative with respect to time. It requires that we know both values of phi into the past as well as into the future. This is not reasonable. The most we could know is phi at time zero from the so-called initial condition. It seems that there is no other option except to use one of the first order accurate formulas, the forward or the backward finite differences. To use the forward finite difference, we consider the current time instance j. On the other hand, to apply the backward finite difference formula, we consider the next time instance j plus 1. Can you spot any difference between the two? Well, looking at the accuracy, it doesn't look like it. They are both delta t plus delta x square accurate. But take a closer look at the formulas. 
The method that uses the forward difference is explicit. And uh, what is that? It means that we can move the method forward without solving any system of equations. This is awesome. On the other hand, the method based on the backward finite difference must solve at each time step a system of equations. Well, think about it. The method based on the forward finite difference must be much faster than the method based on the backward finite difference. And if it is faster and the accuracy is the same, why are we wasting time talking about the method based on the backward finite difference? Well, the answer lies in the stability of both methods. The explicit method is conditionally stable, meaning that time steps larger than a critical time step will lead to unstable behavior. On the contrary, the implicit scheme is unconditionally stable. That is, we can use larger time steps without being afraid that it will lead to instability. If for your specific problem the critical time step is very small, you will have to take a lot of steps to get to where you want to go. Even if each step can be solved very quickly, this can add up to a very long time. With implicit scheme, we can just choose a larger time step and take less steps to reach the end of the simulation without being afraid that it will become unstable. In the end, it will depend on the problem which of the methods will be faster overall. It seems that we can't do better than first order accuracy in time for this problem. Well, not so fast, there is a way to do it. At the current time step, we use a forward finite difference and at the next time step, we use the backward time difference. Sum the formulas and this is the expression for the so-called Crank-Nicholson method, which is second order accurate in both X and T. It is also implicit and unconditionally stable. The only inconvenient is that it is a tad bit more complex to code. Finally, let's look at the example of a vibrating string. It has length 1 and it is clamped at the ends. That takes care of the two boundary conditions needed regarding the spatial derivative. What about the time derivative? It is a second order derivative with respect to time, so we need two initial conditions. The first is just as before the initial configuration of the string, and the second is its initial speed. Just as before, we can try to apply the most accurate finite difference formulas we have available to discretize this differential equation and see if it sticks. So, we apply the central difference formulas for both second order derivatives centered at time instance i and spatial node j. Well, did we bite more than we can chew? Let's see. Let's look at the time instance we need. At first sight, it seems like it. Our equation is asking for the values of phi at three different time instants, i equals 0, 1 and 2. From the initial conditions, we know phi at i equals 0. But we should also know phi at i equals 1. How can we fix this? Well, we have still not used the second initial condition connected to the initial velocity of the string. Actually, we had not really discretized it. If we use a forward difference to do it, we find the values of phi at i equals 1. This approximation to the velocity initial condition is only first order accurate. There are ways to achieve more accurate approximations, but for today we are happy with this. So, writing in a matrix form, we find an explicit scheme to compute phi, which is second order accurate in both space and time. It is, however, also only conditionally stable, as it happens in general with explicit schemes. There are implicit schemes available, but that will have to wait for some other time. This concludes our foray into finite differences applied to problems with more than one dimension. True, we have only applied it to two-dimensional problems, but the step up to more dimensions follows exactly the same rationale. Take care!